Hello and welcome to Out of Your League. This is not Will Perry, this is John Wilkin. Will Perry um, has prioritised other things once again, so I've had to step in last minute. I've only just realised that I'm doing this, Mark, that's correct? Yeah, correct, yes. Yeah, but what we did is something different, um, just to make it all about me, and, and I suppose all about all of us, is we've brought it down to St. Helens. We're here with Paul Wellens, Paul Sculthorpe, and Tommy Makinson at, at Langtree Park ahead of the World Club Challenge, which is a huge game for, for St. Helens and something that we've we've all been part of in the past. How are we guys? We well? Very good, thank you. All good, yourself? Yeah, yeah it's good. It's weird because we spoke on the phone like oh, twice today ago. and yesterday. <laughs> but then what we're trying to do is simulate us having a very formal interview to uh, get things started. To be fair, they were quite fractious conversations we had, so. Well, I'll just summarise mine and Paul's conversation. Yesterday was based around the fact that Man City have been financially cheating for a period of time, which Paul... Yeah, how does he feel about Paul's that? very aggressively in defence of well, Man City. Just, it's a necessary evil, what, uh, the process that we're going through at the moment, but it'll all come out in the wash, you see. It's very sinister, that, isn't it? Mm. How sinister, it'll all come yeah. out in the wash. He was actually under. cheating before Wellow started supporting him, so... Mm. It's, well, not, it's, it's, not, it's not Wellow's fault, is it? It's not Wellow's fault. It's the one and only thing I've known Paul Wellens get riled by is, is football-related <laughs> <Okay>. criticism. <laughs> yeah, so I am reaching it to him. I don't want to come in. <laughs> And Scully, how, how are you, mate? Good, what's, mate. Yeah, yeah, real good. What's been yeah. happening with you? I will say this about you, Scully. Your voice, like, I think the first time you spoke to my auntie, I think her underpants blew off. His voice is that deep. He's like, I think only only whales like white, can speak white. with him. Yeah. That's a oh, great. Flash your name is great, thing. Great. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> how are you, Scully, then? Good, what's mate. Yeah, yeah. All good. All good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, busy with everything. What are you? What are you up to? So obviously, I'm I'm full time with with England. Yeah, you know, working through through the pathway. So working obviously with the the EPS KPS, working with the obviously the England Knights, assistant with uh, with Paul Anderson on that, and working with the, uh, the England youth and doing a bit with the the women as well now, um, helping Craig Craig Richards, which has been it's been really good. Obviously, the women's games really took off you know, over over the last couple of years, and uh, yeah, just doing a bit with with them. Yeah, and how's that going? How's it going? Yeah, it's going, it's it? going really well. You know, the girls are they like sponges. They just want to, they want to learn. They want to, they want to work hard. And uh, it's it's been really enjoyable doing that. Yeah, without being patronised, watching the women's game, it's really come on very, real, it, very quickly, hasn't it? Does that full time environment or the the game's really embraced it now, hasn't it? Taking it seriously, it appears. Yeah, it has, and, and it's, it's probably changing that mentality as well of the of the girls knowing you know the, the opportunity that they've got certainly with the with the home World Cup and. You know, my role within the, the the bigger England group is uh, has been has been great. You know, trying to work th through the through the pathways. You know, working with the the youth, the, the lads at under 16s, and then working obviously with the, the senior blokes as as well, and, and feeding all that that same mentality and you know same players, same same names, and you know, everything else through through that. But it's it's, yeah, it's been good. And obviously, you have to work with Tommy Makerson as part of this process, or you have some interaction with Tommy Makerson. You know, is he likely to play internationally again, or you know, can we just write his international? Career? Uh, I think he's got a point to prove this year. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I think Tommy knows he'll. Uh, so if Tommy's fit, Tom will be. Uh, Tom will be in the mix. You know, he's been he's been outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> how are you, Tommy? Great, good? mate. How are you? Yeah, fantastic. I'm, I'm Thank really you. good. Thanks yeah. for having me. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I just you. I just can't stop looking at your muddy jeans. It's, well, it's actually, freaking me out. So my dogs jumped up at me just before I got here. Um, they're in the they're in the car now. Actually, that's you shouldn't really leave your dogs in a car, should you? But I did crack the windows are cracked, so that's fine. So they'll be fine then, yeah. They'll be fine, yeah. So the dogs jumped up. Uh, I've got muddy uh, paw prints on me. Sorry, mate. It was just a I just noticed. No, and how are you, Tommy? Yeah, you've not fantastic. Been, you've not been yeah. so well this year. Yeah, obviously had a bit of an injury last year with my shoulder and first hero, game. Hero, hero in the grand final. Played on. We beat Salford in the grand final in so 2019. Short. Flash will probably remember. Uh, <laughs> sorry, but yeah, and first 80 minutes back yesterday with a nice win away at Hull. So, yeah, really looking forward to this week. Excellent. His hair's looking well as well. It is, oh, yeah, he's immaculate, isn't he, Tommy? He's one of them who's gone through a transition when I first we first started playing with him. He had quads that looked a bit like chorizo, you know, the sausage. Uh, little Fla chunky, flabby little quads. chunky quads. Oh, it was yeah, it was horrible. And then, but you're a, you're, you're a fine young man now, Tommy. Thank you, John. So are you. And so we're here, oh, really, man. to talk about, I suppose, to talk about St. Helens, but to talk about the World, World Club Challenge, you know, a huge week for, for the club. From a coaching perspective, Wello, what does this week look like? And, and not only that, what has the, the, the build-up 
to this point been like? Has there been a lot of focus to this? I mean, it's about managing kind of managing that because uh, obviously, obviously, since since winning the grand final last year, we've pretty much known that at some point in in, in February we're going to play the, the Sydney Roosters. But uh, you know, with that always being at the forefront of the mind, you don't want to get sidetracked from what is your, your you know your day to day business of, of getting victories in Super League and obviously the pre season attacking that, doing what you need to do to put yourself in the in the best position to to perform well once the season starts. Uh, you know, apart from one disappointing performance at, at Warrington uh, the other week, we've you know we've had a pretty good start to the season. Uh, but, but yeah, you know, this Sydney Roosters game is something that we've been thinking about for a long time and something we're excited about as a, as a club. Does your scheduling change because it's rare that you have to peak four games into a season if you're not playing in a World Cup challenge? Bear in mind, you've played three games. You've got a massive game this weekend. Has the pre-season scheduling changed at all from from years gone by? No, not really. Uh, we uh, we we had a pre-season camp over in Tenerife. That's uh, the first time in about ten or eleven years we've been away. So, but we had we'll a promise one of them in, in two thousand. Mike, Mike Rush, Mike Rush promised that we'd go away every, every year, every year. Yeah, well, he delivered on his promise this year. So we went away to Tenerife, and it was it was a fantastic uh, week's training, a really really tough week's training, which uh, I'm sure Tommy will testify to as well, having watched it from the sidelines with the injured crew. But uh, you know, it, it was. Uh, it was a great week where we, you know, we put in a lot of hard work, got the preparation right that we feel we needed to do to, to start the season well. Uh, but to you know, answer your question around scheduling, not a lot's changed. We, we have a pretty standard procedure in and around our schedule, and uh, sometimes the simplicity of that is, is kind of what makes things work so well. And just to sort of get into the insight of the coaching uh, sort of staff, how far into the past have you been looking at the Roosters? You know, how much have you delved into what they do, or has it been solely focused on? What Saints can deliver? At this moment in time, it's been very much about what we can do and how, how, you know how we can perform at our best. You know, we just had a game at the weekend at Hull. Uh, you'd be foolish to be thinking about uh, the Sydney Roosters when you've got to go to, to Hull and perform well. And you know, given the, the way they started the season, so thankfully we had a good performance. We've had a good win. To, to take confidence into, into this game is massive for us. But we know that we're coming up against a you know really formidable. Formidable team. Uh, you know, I think the first team to win back-to-back -back titles in the NRL for a long time, which just gives a, you know an indication to, to the quality that, uh, that they have. But again, th that's an exciting challenge for us. You, you, you know, you get to you get to pit your wits against one of the best teams and some of the best players in the world. And uh, I'm sure there'll be a full house here on on Saturday evening to, to to cheer us on, and hopefully we can give a good account of ourselves. Scully, where, where do you think then, if if we're talking about the World Club Challenge and obviously it, it's the NRL versus Super League, um, you know, where do you see you know the NRL in comparison to Super League? What what are the big differences and and what are the strengths and weaknesses of either? I think the uh, I think the big difference in the NRL is is the, is the pool of players. I think we see at international level, um, you know, the Australians can field five or six international teams of the same level, uh, just the, the pool of players that they've got and um, I think that's the, the biggest difference is probably the, the competition that they get week in week out which sometimes we don't get in, in Super League and, and, and the quality of, of players throughout the squads um, but I think you, your best teams and, and for me obviously Saints are, are the best team in Super League, they proved that all last year against their best team I don't think you, I don't think there's a lot in it. No, no. Um, you know, it's, it's and you know, in regards to your question to Wello about you know how much have you looked at the Roosters and you probably can't look at them because I mean their season's not kicked off yet. There's been big changes in their squads. You know, obviously a lot of the the stuff that they did in 2019 that have gone through Cooper Cronk and you know he's no longer there. Obviously, Latrell Mitchell's moved on. Um, there's there's going to be changes in in their squads. So you know, the the best thing is is control what you can control, which is is. Saints looking after their performance and uh, you know well, I'll tell you one guy who did look after his performance and especially in World Club challenges was, was you Scully you know you, you uh, visibly sort of rose to the occasion in some of the I suppose one of the maybe one of the biggest games in, in my career was that 2007 World Club challenge but if we go back you know 2000 uh, 2001, 2003, hugely successful period for St Helens. How big was the World Club Challenge amongst all of that? Because you're winning bits, things are happening anyway. How important did you rank the World Club Challenge? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it, it was it was Great Britain v Australia for me, and and so you know, in a player's point of view, it was always a, it was always a massive game, and a, a game that you wanted to win. Uh, that was a time, probably an era where we were really 
competitive at international level as well. Um, you know, we I've I, I sampled both sides of it. You know, got two good irons and two good wins in the uh, in the World Club Challenge. So, but it was always one that that I, I always you know tried to get myself up for in, in regards to you know upping your performance even more than you would do on a on a on a, on a Super League level. Um, you know, not like you you know you you don't give everything every game, but I always thought it brought out the best in me as a as a player. You know the the games against the the Australians, be it at world club level or or uh, international. Do you, do you think, Flash, that the the, the, um, the world club challenge? I'm not going to say it's been devalued, but been demystified by the presence of our younger players in in the NRL. You you obviously went out to the NRL um, and probably actually before there was the trend to go before out it there. Was cool. Yeah, because you you're independently financially fine, so you could go out there Bullshit. and take a pay cut. It was fine. I was on pay cut. It was fine. <laughs> He's got the trust fund to fall back on. Absolutely fine, no. But you went out yeah. there, you trailblazed, didn't you? I and was a trailblazer, yeah. <laughs> you were? No, I was, I was a young kid who'd only played a few games at, at Wigan and got offered an opportunity and thought it was um, something I couldn't couldn't miss, really. I'd always grown up watching Adrian Morley and Brad Fittler and all the superstars and thought it was, it was always worth worth giving it a go and it was it worked out great for me. And Just to go back on the point of why the Australian game is so strong, I think... Um, they get the first pick of all the athletes coming through because it's such a big game over there. All the, the biggest, fastest, strongest kids play rugby league, whereas you know, if you're a great athlete over here, you might play football, you might play rugby union. Are you saying that Tommy's not a great athlete? Well, Tommy's he's, um, he's a bit of fine wine, hasn't you? You've come good these last few years, haven't you? Um, <laughs> different from the, the podgy lad I first met in, in 2012. But, yeah, <laughs> but with it being at the forefront of, of, of sport and the media over there, they get the best athletes and it's such a big game. But um, in, in respect to the World Cup Challenge, I don't think they take it as seriously as we do. Um, the fact that it's, 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 it's a game that's, that's played two or three weeks before their season starts, they kind of see it as a bit of a, a warm-up fixture these days. But I think probably 10, 15 years ago when... You know, the Roosters came over and Brisbane came over. It was held in, in higher esteem over there. Did he, did he not take it seriously? I don't think they do as much as they used to. Yeah, you may say that from a, from a kind of collective point of view, but I think the Roosters and Trent Robinson in particular, mm. uh, as, you know, given the time that he spent over here with Catalan in, in Super League, I think he has a real affection for the competition. Mm. And any opportunity he's had to bring the Roosters over, he's always jumped in it with, and took that opportunity with both hands. Even uh, a few years ago when they weren't actually the champions and there was a three-game series, mm. he still brought, brought his team but, over then. But like Melbourne, they, they refused to come over when... So Leeds had to travel to them a few yeah. years ago, didn't they? Because they said, well, we're not going, you'll have to come to us because they didn't value it that much in order to come and play. I don't, think it, I don't think it makes or breaks the, the no. season, whether they win it or they lose it. But, yeah. you know, you, you say to Darren Lockyer that you don't care whether you win or not. Yeah. You see Darren Lockyer's face in, in 2001 and 2007. Yeah. He, no, he was he happy they happy. lost. <laughs> you know, yeah. and I think it's, it's an insult to say otherwise that, that them, them boys go out there to win the game. Um yeah, like you say, it's, pretty, it's scheduled different yeah. in their season to to ours. You know, we're a couple of games in, and and usually the game is is over here. Yeah, and how much Tommy? I, I tried to get that out of Flash about the guys playing in the NRL now. As a, as a young player, a young international player, um, how has that changed things? How has that changed the market? You know, for you as a player, as it maybe opened your eyes to the NRL? Has, has the NRL become less of a mystery, you know, through it all? Yeah, I'd probably say that less of a mystery. I think more and more lads are going out there now, aren't they? And it's more an open conversation where they are starting to look over here more. And, and I think that's just come from the, res the respect they have for this competition now. They know that a lot of good young lads are coming from here and, and they can go and transition to NRL pretty well. So, yeah, back to, the, back to this game, I just think how uh, much of a, hopefully a tight game it'll be and we can prove how much we win us and how much we want to win this game and and for them to respect us a bit more. Do you watch a lot of the NRL, Tommy? Do you take uh, an interest? I did when uh, when Flash were playing. <laughs> I used to watch my old mate get smashed a bit. Uh, <laughs> but no, not I don't watch it as much as I should, but I know that you know, they're all competitors. And yeah. go back to what Scully said, I think it's... Do you watch any rugby? Uh, just just tennis, really. Just tennis? tennis. <laughs> no, I watch a bit of, bit, of, bit of the NRL and most, obviously, Super League. And it comes back to what Scully said. I think whenever you put the Aussies against against any of us it's just I just look as it is a, a GB against against the Aussies so. Do you have an opportunity to go over there in this last few years when you've kind of you, your career's gone on to another level and you've like obviously won the golden boot I'm, I'm sure they would have, some clubs over there would have come knocking and what was it was it a temptation for yeah you? it was definitely a temptation I was over there at the end of uh, 2018 flew to Oz and you know I had a good look around the clubs over there and where, where it, was a, it was an option I won't say where I went but I went 
a, a good few it's clubs, good six or seven clubs, and it, it does open your eyes. You know, to what you were saying, we'll call it. It is a. It's just a. It's the main sport over there, isn't it? It's such a big competition, and it definitely does open your eyes. But yeah, yeah ended up staying. But you go into this <laughs> game not not fearful of of the roosters. Not at all. It's just another opportunity to, for me and the lads to prove how good we are. Because, like you said, they don't think they respect this game as much as as we do, and I don't think they respect us as as much as we do them. And you know what I mean. So I'm really looking forward to to proving how good we are. Yeah, and you you guys obviously working at England. Um, you'll have seen directly the impact of lads playing in the NRL. You know, it's not something, Scully, that was... With Adrian Morley, maybe, was he around our era? He's the only guy who really went out there and did it, apart from randomly Mark Edmondson, who sort of went out yeah. as well. Yeah, I mean, do you know, being in around the thing, and well, I'll tell you the same, that was one of the great things about Wayne Bennett. He used to speak to the, the England players, and, you know, the lads will tell you that. That he always said to them, don't forget where, where you know, there's, there's numerous players now who are, are some of the best players in the NRL, not just surviving mm -hmm. you know the thriving and, and the leading the way you know you look at Sam Burgess when he was there Josh Hodgson John Bateman he said don't forget these are guys who've learned to trade in in Super League he said do not under undervalue what, what your competition and, and what your game's about in England and I thought that was one of the one of the great things that, that Wayne used to say about about British Rugby League and uh, they certainly don't you know, underestimate us. Yeah, I'm, I'm, well, with, I'm with you there, Scully. I think like you look at Wayne Bennett; he's probably one of the more, or he is the most successful NRL coach of all of all time. And he was so respectful of this game and how much he perceives the game from over in the NRL. He he loved, and he, that's what he always said. Then he just don't ever forget where you've come from, where you played, and the respect we have for this league. So, if someone like that is is looking at our game like that, we should we should only just keep pushing forward and get better. And is there an element of of, of sadness that Wayne's moved on? You know what I'm saying? It's a, it's a big point in the timeline of the international sort of development for for to part ways with it, with an international coach. Yeah, it? I mean, it's difficult for me to comment on that yeah. in regards to being involved with it. Um, you know, I, I don't think a lot of the, the media or the people outside the the England setup uh, realise what, what Wayne was about. Um, you know, he's... Uh, the players loved him. He was a great bloke to be around, wasn't he, in, in camp. You know, real good, you know, real... You know, funny bloke, and you know people don't see that because I think of Wayne's relationship with the with the media and, and the way certain things can come across. Um, for me, the question is is whether he knows enough about our our game, our players over here. You know, is it is it is a full time head coach in in the NRL? He's got a job to do over there. Um, so for me, that's the that's the question in him. You know, carrying on that that reign as uh, as England coach. Well, it's moved on. I think uh, I think Sean Wayne's. Uh, He's a, he's a great man for the job. Yeah, for sure. It's funny that actually Wayne's uh, warmth, when, when players spoke of Wayne, they speak of him in, in such warm sort of tones and language, don't they? But when the media sort of... I, I've seen it from the other side. So I've worked uh, uh, in the media uh, uh, and trying to interview... And I think that's probably... Wayne. You know, Wayne's probably come over with a lot of the the thoughts that he has about the media that, that he gets in the NRL. You know, it's probably like being a, a Premier League footballer or coach over here. Um, you know, the scrutiny that they, they get put under... And he's probably his back was up before he realised that a lot of our media are a pro rugby league. You know, they they want to spread the the great word about the the game and, and be positive about things. And um, Wayne don't care about that. You know, he, he he is what he is. He's 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 nobody to to prove anything to. All his thoughts and his cares will be about his players and his staff, and and that's where it ends. It doesn't have to please anybody. It doesn't have to please the media. Uh, and unfortunately, that can come over as a, as a negative in. You know, our our game needs to be positive and, and needs that positive angle with the with the media. And what about coaching? Well, you, you know, Wayne Bennett, we recruited Wayne Bennett to, to coach internationally. And obviously we're talking about the NRL and Super League and it sort of extended on that topic. What do you, do you have any take on the perception or the, the standard of coaching in the NRL and where that's at? I think it's very hard for me to comment in terms of I've never spent any, any time in the NRL. Uh, uh, what I do know is that over here we've got a lot of very, very good coaches. Uh, I don't think the NRL are doing anything in particular you know, mind-blowing that, that we're not seeing over here. Uh, like I said they, they do have a get to work with a, a bigger, bigger pool of players than, than than what we do. I think we have a lot of good coaches and we have a, a 
bigger challenges over here, particularly around youth development, is to get those kids through and get them to the next level, whereas perhaps it could be a bit more cutthroat in the NRL. If you're not quite good enough, you're not good enough. Whereas over mm -hmm. here, it's getting those people who are not quite good enough to a level where they are good enough, spending more time, working harder with them, because we're not afforded the riches and you know the, the, the size of the pool that they are in the NRL. So it's a real test of coaching then, in Super League, isn't it? I think I think so. In, in Super League and within within youth development, uh, in not not just at this club at St Helens, in uh, every club is to to you know see the best in every every kid that you've got because you know <laughs> you used Tommy as an example before. And we have a laugh and a joke, but you know when he was a young player, he probably wasn't quite at the level in terms of you know, mentally and physically. He wasn't where he would, where we knew he could be at. Uh, and he didn't know that at the time. Over a period of time and experience and people spending time and educating and working with him developed, developed into one of the best wingers in the world uh, and, and, and largely down to his hard work off the back of that. Uh, but maybe in the NRL, someone like Tommy wouldn't have got the opportunity to kick on. But over there, the, it's probably a, a lot more... I think that's, where, that's where Flash's comment about the NRL and that's what yeah. I said about the pool of players... It's their national game, so kids yeah, yeah. grow up wanting to be an NRL player. Um, so, you know, I don't know what their selection process is like. You know, for, for me, ours is too young. Uh, I'm not a big fan of, of scholarships. I think it's not so much the selection at a young age, it's the deselection. So you get your late developers who come through at 18, 19. If you're not already in that system and been able to sustain it like Tommy did, you know, and you, yeah, and you yeah. don't get in at 15, yeah. you might never get that chance when you're ready. But what, when, what age were you? Recruited Scully. I signed when I was, I signed when I was fourteen. Yeah. When I was at Warrington, that's literally just to get your signature. You know, you get a bit of cash and uh, <laughs> and that's locked away till you till you leave school because the scholarship wasn't about then. It was it was straight into the academy at, at sixteen when you when you leave school. But to be fair, Scully was six foot four, speaking like that <laughs> at was. thirteen. Absolutely, <laughs> great. <laughs> Barry White, <laughs> old and Barry White, like just Paul. just coming through He's school. Like, how do you feel about your can you imagine, Paul? Can yeah, imagine thanks, playing yeah. against him when you're horrible, like fifteen? Horrible. I'm He's like just, I reckon Scully's probably retired more kids they played against <laughs> Scully once and they were like that just let, let, let Scully just hammer punched just him into the, the ground let the football do the work mate let the football do the work <laughs> I played against uh, Scully's brother Danny and, uh, when we were kids growing up and he, he, well, he was horrible he was very, oh, yeah. horrible. He was very <laughs> similar you know on, on rugby, rugby fields when you used to see like a, a scuffle had start and it, people would be one in all in it like people would fly into to fights back in the old days of the Biff this was different when Danny Scofield was on the field. He would be chasing lads around the field, <laughs> and we'd be running for our lives. It was a it was a really a scar, scarring moment in my junior <laughs> development. <laughs> it's funny that actually, because you and your brother are massively different in that in that regard, aren't you? You know, as as, as uh, like you, Scully, like yeah, world, pretty chilled. world class player, but so relaxed. Like I was dead surprised when I signed for Saints and I walked into the dressing room. I was I was surprised how chilled you were like you're sort of this hero sort of guy who I looked up to but you, you've always been very, really relaxed about your, your profession yeah I'm, I'm you know quite quite comfortable with you know back in back your own ability really I've always had a good work ethic and uh, yeah I don't I don't see the thing in in wasting energy being being nervous or you know being fired up all the time I am quite a, a relaxed laid back person and um, just enjoyed doing what we do and yeah, it's Scully as well. When we were younger, he introduced two things to me: drinking Guinness like in copious amounts. <laughs> you know, you talk about cultural architects. You know, we do all this stuff. The two guys to my left here took me out drinking all the time, like basically forced shots down my neck all the time, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no yeah. apologies. Yeah. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> Made you the man you are. <laughs> Probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to speak to my wife. I don't think she's too happy about all that stuff. But so, Tommy. Well, I mentioned something there about your transition, right, from, I think there's a point in people's life where your career could go one way or the other, and there's exceptions, and I, I might put you in that category, Scully, where you were that good at, at, all the way through, like you were pretty much world class from being 16, 17, and, but for you, Tommy, that, I don't, that's not been the case, has it? And there was a point where things clicked. Have you had chance to sort of, look back at that point where things changed for you and what it was yeah i just think it was a it was a multiple of things really i think i had a, a couple of uh i was playing well and then a couple of bad injuries so some ones what made you look back and think well you know sort of like this is a line now where i'll have a start got really working hard and, and cracking down and and to try and fulfill my potential or i could go the other way and in 2016 i think i got it was my second acl 
and I just sort of, you know, well, I'll, I'll tell you, I just, I just nailed down after that and just tried to, to real work hard and fulfil my potential because I knew, you know, it was like, you know, sort of one, one or two more little niggles and a few bad more games, I think, was on the way out. So, yeah, that was a real, you know, real turning stone for us. It's a part and parcel of the game, as we, as we all know that, and your ACL is just unlucky, you know. Johnny, Johnny's been through it, hasn't he, with, with his, you know, similar injuries and stuff. But you might have just been a late developer, you know, that's some don't get that opportunity to get to that point where where they are ready, mm. and and that for me is is where you know I think we'll be we'll be losing some quality players. It, you know, re resilience is a big thing though. Whether you're a late developer or you get injuries, I think resilience is the thing that always comes to the fore whenever like your chips are down. Because there's <clears throat> I know loads of lads who I'll see now in Oldham who were better players than me, and they go, oh yeah, yeah, I got pitched instead of you. Yeah, but you know when you got that little niggle or something went didn't go right. They didn't. They didn't react the right way, and I've pro you're probably one of those that a series of you know setbacks or you know as you're coming through, people going ahead of you. That resilience probably took you to where you. Like you now. said, there, Scully. The more I think back, probably a bit of that crept in as well because I was really, I was very immature, and you know I just didn't know what I had until you know until I got older, and I can really feel myself you know improving each year now as well. So maybe then I would just just yeah, wasn't ready. Yeah, you know like I mean? flashes. You know, you've you, you've got that resilience. You've you've proven it the way you the way you have come back and. Uh, I think it is, it's, 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 that is a massive one because I don't think if you've got that, if you've got the work ethic, you, you won't make it. You certainly won't make it at, at top level. You know, you've seen how many players have we seen across the years. You know, I'd rather have somebody with the work ethic, with the attitude and that, than somebody who's got natural ability and and has not got that work ethic or you know wants to take the shortcuts because you know natural ability will open the door for you, but then you've got to get through it and you've you've, you've got to work hard and you don't want to just survive. You know, I, I certainly didn't. I wanted to be the best, you know, not just be a Super League player. I wanted to be the best Super League player or, you know, you play international level and you want to win things. You know, it's not just happy to take the paycheck and, and, and play in the games. You, you want to make a difference. Do, do we measure resilience in the sport? Well, uh, as a coach, is that it's, how can you hard, how can you measure that? Because I agree, I think the thing that maybe all players need is the ability to face, come face to face with failure, um, deal with it and improve and go forward from it. Not to look back and blame, and, and but essentially resilience is overcoming failures repeatedly isn't it? and every time learning and getting better and not letting those failures consume you. But how do you measure that in young athletes? I don't, I don't think you, you, you can measure it. Then. It's, a, it's, a, it's character, isn't it? And you, that's not black and white. I think it's emotional intelligence of understanding a person and what motivates them and what the pros and cons and yeah it's, I think it's, it's it's not as black and white as just a yes what, and no what is it? point are you making a call on young players on whether they're going to be resilient or enough oh oh you know is there is there a point in a player's timeline at which those decisions are probably being made I'm not just pointing the finger at you well because <laughs> yeah, you're a coach well, yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> no no I'm saying the game I'm talking as the you know the, the, the wider you I mean I think you know, at different levels, at different clubs, people are making decisions on players all the time. Uh, at scholarship level, like Scully said, at 14, 15, perhaps people are making decisions on players, which I agree with him. That's far too young to, to be ostracising people. And But I would say as well, within that, within the community game, uh, in always encouraging young players to stay in the game and stay involved. Show that resilience because your opportunity might come down the track. Uh, but under 19s level, players will come and leave professional clubs. Uh, even you know, players will be released from first team duties. Do they want a, a Super League club? Do they then want to go and play in the Championship? Do they still have that appetite for the game? I think as a game, we can still continue to give these players support. They have a, an, an exit strategy for players that are moved on from various levels to try and keep them within the game. Because uh, when you hear Scully talk about his passion for rugby, it's because he loved the game first and foremost, whether he was an amateur or professional, it was the same for us all. And I assume that we love what we do. That should never change, really. It, but circumstances with, throughout a player's career, and certainly when it becomes professional, can change that and you can have a different viewpoint on the game through through poor experiences. And what uh, did you have a point in your career? Well, uh, I'm asking you this question, but I pretty much like played side by side with you for a long time. But there was was there a point in your career where your resilience got tested? Uh, I think early early on in my, in my career, well, probably uh, early on, a few things around injuries, uh, like Tommy's touched on, uh, fractured my cheekbone, I had a knee operation, I got unfit. Uh, and started to play poorly off the back of it. 
uh, the first time in, in my career really I'd start to have people ask questions about me uh, and I basically had to work hard and get fit again that was that was the answer it took me a while to get round to that to compute it in my head but I, that's what I had to do and I suppose latterly later in my career from a performance point of view and you was involved in this as well was losing five grand finals and then having to go back there again and win one we had to show some resilience to keep going back there because it was it was Pretty, pretty men mentally scarring when you keep going to a grand final and you which, keep losing. Which pre-season was it where uh, conditioning said, was it Stella was a low-calorie drink and Bex. you drank loads of it? Yeah, the conditioner Bex. told Wallow that <laughs> if he drank Bex, he'd come back in in good nick. It didn't work well, did it, Paul? <laughs> no, it didn't end well, that, did it? particularly because I wasn't running at the time. But again, you learn through experiences, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> uh, very, very poor. But again, like you said, we touched on Tommy doing stuff like that. Uh, like the word professionalism springs to, to mind for me because... People uh, and a lot of uh, young players in particular think that when you sign for a, a Super League club, that, that means you're professional. And professionalism, uh, professionalism is, for me, isn't getting paid to do what you do. Professionalism, and professionalism is the choices that you make. And that's where I see Tommy's improvements. Is. There was a day that, where Tommy became a professional. Now, we've been getting paid for playing rugby for a long time. But there was a time come in his career where he, he, he understood what being a professional was, making the right choices, putting the right foods in his body, having a drink every now and again, but knowing what was the right time and the wrong time. And then his performances and the way he trained and everything just went to a new level because professionalism took over his life. At the start of 14, um, I remember I, I saw a resilience in you that I, I probably didn't... Ex well, I thought it was quite unique when... Was that seven, uh, 14 when you... you they wanted Johnny to play fullback, didn't they? Yeah. And they changed your squad number and you kind of got messed, not messed around, but you played a bit of six, came off the bench at nine. You played pretty much every position on the field, didn't you? And for a club legend like yourself, who's won Lance Todd trophies and Man of Steels and a legend around here, to, to not get messed around, but not to be valued as he probably deserved. Was that a, a key moment in your career in terms of resilience and kind of sticking to your guns and, and working through something because I thought it was quite a unique situation. Well, it came through experiences really because we'd had Daniel Anderson at the club and we'd had a, a fair bit of success with Daniel and then we had Mick Potter and Royce uh, after that in quick succession and both fantastic guys, both good coaches but they both ended up paying, like lo losing the jobs. <clears throat> and I thought when Nathan Brown came in and took over, he, he came as the coach, I was the captain, I thought, you know what, I'm going to do everything to support the coach and back the coach. He's going to come, he's quite clearly a good coach, he's had success with Huddersfield, uh, I'm going to back him as the captain because if I back him as the captain then the rest of the players will, will, will hopefully follow uh, little did I know that in a few months time Nathan Brown was going to sit me down and say uh, look I'm thinking of playing Johnny fullback I'm going to move your position so I had a bit of a, a wrestle in my mind do I go in and say no I'm the captain I want to play fullback or do I do what I originally said I wouldn't, you know, as captain of the club and, and support the coach. And I chose the latter, I supported the coach. But I made it quite clear to him that, look, I see myself in this team. Uh, I still feel like I do a job at full back, but I'm happy to play in other positions. But I want to be playing, uh, and with, to which he agreed. Uh, <clears throat> and it, as it turned out, it was a real good experience for me. I was playing a uh, bit loose forward, a bit of standoff, like you're saying. It kind of gave me a, a renewed energy a little bit to, to experience something a little bit different. And as it transpired through, midway through the year, uh, poor Johnny got uh, an injury and, and was out for the season. And I ended up back at fullback anyway. So I tend to think if I'd have gone the other way, in the other direction early on, and I maybe would have took my ball home and threw my toys out the pram or however you want to word it, yeah, then I, I would have got I think that's a massive one for me. That, that just sums well up, though. And that, that's his personality. Not a lot of people are, are like that, and I know it was filthy because he, he phoned me when uh, when they, they changed the numbers, yeah. when it's they took the, the number one squad number off him, and and that's the competitor in him. You know that you you want to be number one. You know yeah. that's his position that he's always been. Which choice but, there, Scully? Was he ego get involved? Want it? Or, of course it does. Or try and be an accommodator and help yeah, yeah. other people. There's a fine it's line between ego mean, and pride. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah, what I'm saying. Yeah. It was what, more yeah. that was a pride thing, yeah. and, and and that's right and rightly so. Yeah, you know yeah. he'd earned that. He'd, he'd been the, the, the mm. Great Britain fullback for years and and done a job, but was still performing, and and still thought you know he could. He could do the job that he's always done. Otherwise, you know, me knowing well, though, he, he wouldn't have put himself in that position. Did you ever have a time where your pride was in a, in a yeah, decision? Yeah, it, it, it was. It was a bit different for me because, you know, as we know, the, the the last two years of my career, I struggled with with injuries, and it was that was the frustrating thing. I don't know whether, I don't know whether we all have a time where, 
your body and it, in, you say your body you know your body packs in or your, your body's telling you that you've you've, you've played enough games uh, and for me I was probably still as fit as, as I'd ever been probably fitter but probably because I had to I thought I had to work harder to to get back on the field um, and it just I just seemed to get injury after injury you know did me did me Achilles freak injuries mm. You know, I, did, I dislocated my me, me shoulder, obviously, at Wembley. I'd done the injury four weeks previously, scoring two tries in a man-of-the-match performance against Castleford. And I have to reach for the line to score the second try and I, I tear all the ligaments in my shoulder. And do you feel, thinking, do you, you feel know, like, when, when you think your time's up... Do you feel like... Did you feel that everything was against you at that period of your career? Because you'd, you'd... I mean, like we said, dealing with negativity and maybe failure, you, you, you'd had an unbelievable career. Don't get me wrong, the, I'm sure winning and losing along the way, but this was your biggest challenge, was it? Or, or it felt like maybe a challenge? Yeah, it, it was, but I don't know what the challenge was because no. everything that was put in front of me in regards to, right, well, if you do this and you do the rehab and... You know, talking about the World Club, you know, obviously when I come back in in 2007, you know, I normally played at 9,900 kilos, and I come back at that 107 kilos because I did nothing but lived in the gym, you know, with with AP, to do everything that would get me out on that field. And uh, I couldn't do any more. But then, you know, the, the following month or so, I snapped my Achilles in a, in a, in a captain's run, a, yeah. a light training session, and I'd had no... Achilles strains, no calf strains, no anything. It was like bang, and I'm just going, what, what can you do? No, what, no. Is, what is the challenge? No, no, you yeah. know, and, and that was a frustrating thing for me, and it was, obviously, Ando had come in, so I was in and out with, with injury, and, and probably when I come back, he, he's playing me a different way because I've not been involved in the, in the team, and that was probably the frustrating thing, is not having the, the same impetus in a, in a game as, as I'd always had, you know, throughout my career. Was that the hardest part of your career, that? Scott? Yeah, it was, it was a frustrating two years. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've done some, some great things, you know, obviously picked the, the Challenge Cup up in 2006, then I missed the, the, the um, sorry, the 2007, then I missed the 2007 Challenge Cup. In between, I'd won a World Club Challenge against, uh, against Brisbane, missed the, the Grand Final in 2007, uh, and then obviously 2008, was a pretty good season until the until the Scully. <laughs> was it was it annoying for you that you was this you know specimen of an athlete, great player, you know coming back and and getting a bit you know them niggly injuries and and someone like Wilco, who was obviously in in really bad nick, full to the brim, full to the brim would be actually full to the brim again. Never ever got in, never got injured. Did that, did that annoy you any any spell? Life's not fair, is it? <laughs> Life's not fair, uh, is it? We've oh. all got to stop waiting for life to be fair. <laughs> hey, do you know a fair player to Wilco? You know he took his opportunity, and uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was there with the, I was there I was there with the voodoo doll in the background. Yeah, uh, no, but yeah, I mean, look, it's funny, isn't it? Because adversity and stuff can be back ended in your career. Like I watched, we watched, well, we talk about Sam Burgess. We had Sam Burgess on, and. He pretty much all of his adversity has come at the back end yeah. of his career, yeah. and 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 when I when I saw that with Sam, I thought childhood sort of prodigy, you know, careers he's achieved everything, yeah. and then the back end of his career, the injuries really. Did did you look at that and th feel some sort? Yeah, of yeah, I, and certainly watching it? watching Sam's story evolve was was very very similar to to me, and um, you know it, it, it's. You know what a great career he's had, and you know to to finish it pre prematurely, um, it'd have been it'd have been frustrating for Sam, you know, and and that was certainly the case for me. I went I went ten twelve years without virtually without injury, you know, mm. I've been ninety six to to two two thousand and five ninety six. I know, maybe oh that's me. Inter that's, that's me international debut. Will tell me how old are you in ninety six? I played ninety four, <laughs> ninety four for Inter. <laughs> Um, oh. You know, and then internationally, well, from from '96 to 2005, you know, yeah. a ten-year back-to-back, and you think that it's got to take its toll. You know, I remember having a conversation we were about with Wello before with uh, with Britty when Britty was over, and he retired at about 47 or something, didn't he? He was, yeah, uh, yeah. No, he was about 38, yeah. and I'd played something like 150 more games than Britty yeah. when he retired at 38. Just you know, the, obviously the the games that we played, and and I think when you're in a successful side as well, so you're playing you're playing all through the the Challenge Cup rounds, you're playing through all the the, uh, the playoff series and, and playing. Basically, the you played about and, forty games a year since yeah. you were seventeen, and then back to back with, with <laughs> yeah. international for, yeah, so for ten years. I mean. So there's got to become a point where yeah. 
Has there, has there been a change in mentality though? Because I know some some Burgess Scully maybe uh, they went full throttle for the you know that that period in their careers. You know I, I watched young Matty Ashton at Warrington who started the year fantastically well, but then misses out this week. Is there, do you reckon there's more of an awareness, Weller, to to manage? Players longevity or, or not? Uh, potentially, I mean, I, I couldn't speci speak specifically about that situation with Matty Ashton, but yeah, I think there is a you know, where athletes are monitored more now than they than they ever have been, uh, uh, and with with a view to you know getting the best out of them over a, over a longer period, and if it means players not playing the odd game every now and again, so they are better off further down the track than than coaches and performance staff do do make those decisions. Uh, but I also think as well, do, do we not now get obsessional with like when people talk about finishing players players finishing the career, we get kind of obsessed with how old how old was you when yeah. you retired? When weird, isn't when it? Scully if Scully had made his debut at twenty and retired at thirty five it would have been fine. It, it, it appeared that he retired early yeah. because he was third, 29, 30. When, when actually he'd been playing since he was 16. So he's, he's had a, a long career. Yeah. As Sam Burgess has had a long career. It's funny that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I've never yeah. really thought about it like that. But when you think, it's, it's yeah, mad. It's we, we, we set this sort of weird sort of benchmark of like a long career on the 32, yeah. 33 or something. But it's just... Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. For, for me, do you know what? The, I could have carried on playing. I, it wasn't an injury that was a career. You know, Sam's is, was a was a career ender. Um, mine, I just had a succession, and I've just, you know, I dislocated my shoulder. I I stayed on. Obviously, that was in the would have been the August. I was contracted till December anyway. I didn't have to be thinking I'd finished my my contract that year. Got a payout with with Saints, and then I was I was free anyway. It was my last season, but I still come into the club every day with the boys and they did, did the rehab and. Literally retired as fit as I've ever been. You know, I had offers to carry on playing, but for me mentally, I'd, I'd done everything that I wanted to do. And being at Saints for 11 years and playing in big games, I didn't want to just carry on playing for the sake of playing. You know, I had other things which I'd, I'd done throughout my career to move on to. And I just thought the time's right. And, you know, my last game was in a Challenge Cup final. What a career. I was very glad he retired because it freed up a lot of room on the salary cap, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> there was there was, there was was several knocks on the door when Scully's <laughs> shoulder Amos popped out. Yeah. Yeah. Shoulder popped out the last time like that. Come on, the, the, come on. Eamon told me like. about 15 minutes after I uh, announced my retirement, he got a phone call. <laughs> as soon as <laughs> I found out well, his squad number had been dropped, I was like, did you need a new captain? Typical. So this week, right, World Club Challenge, it's a huge occasion for, for Saints, for Super League, and, and you know, we've spoken about NRL and, and Super League, but are these the, the nights where you'll miss playing, you know, these games? Because you're not going to miss Wakefield away, with all due respect to Wakefield, it's a lovely place. Um, you're not going to miss, you're not going to miss those games, are you? It's these games, surely. Yeah, I think you know the, the big games, the finals. When you get that buzz, even now when I go out with the team, and uh, you know I'm only going out there to warm them up and helping the skill drills before the, before the game. But when you walk out of the tunnel with them and the raw goes up, you get that little bit of a feeling that you used to get. Like it would be special to be out there now, and uh, it's probably trying to you know influence you know, to the boys you know, how lucky they are to to play in games like that. You know, to play in a World Club Challenge, you have to have won a grand final first and foremost. So not everybody gets the opportunity to do that. So when that the opportunity to do that on on top of winning a grand final comes around, you, you grab it with both hands and you and you, you savor the moments because they like said we all had very long careers and we managed to play in three or four World Club challenges ourselves, uh, and you, you you know you savor them. Uh, like I say we had success in some and not in others, but I, I certainly do. Mm. Grand finals, Challenge Cup finals, World Club challenges, they're, they're the game. I don't miss playing week to week. No, no. You know, I've not missed it at all. And people people don't grasp that. Mm -hmm. I think it's because you're still involved with the game and you're still you know, in and around the boys. That's the bit that everyone says, oh, you know, you miss. Well, I still get that. And, you know, when yeah, you're coaching yeah. as well. Um, but that walking out over, you know, that, that corner at Old Trafford or, you know, walking out here on, on Saturday, it's just a it's a special moment. And, and to play in them big games um, at that next level, you know, he's, uh, he's real special and, you know, there's a lot of people, like Wello said, who, who've not had that opportunity, you yeah. know, and I think all of us have been have been very fortunate to play and, and win, you know, grand finals and, and be in these big games. Yeah, it's a privilege, Tommy, to, to play in the World Club Challenge, isn't it? Obviously, you had an experience in, in, in 2015. What, what did that teach you and what can you use from that game this week? Yeah, just 
it was a bad experience. We got absolutely pumped in me off off South. It was a it was a bad night for all of us. But it just like you said, just you realise how lucky you are. Like Wello said, you've got to, to to win a grand final, and that's what we've done. And I just feel we've come such a long way as a as a club from then, and and to hopefully prove against the Roosters how good this team actually is, and go on and win it. So you say it's come a long way. Describe what does it, what does that look like? You know, got rid of the, some deadwood. Like yeah, got rid of some poor players. Yeah, thank you. Uh, not you, mainly Flash. <laughs> nah, nah. Uh, we just, yeah, we've just, we've just moved on as, as, as a team. We've fresh, fresh ideas. New coach, Justin's done great work over the last two years, getting us ready mentally for these big games. I think we've become such a, a better team in big, in them big game moments, and we certainly wasn't ready for that test the last time the World Challenge come round. But this time we know we spoke about being world class all pre-season. That's what our whole emphasis has been, and whether that's training outside off the pitch or whether it's when we you know, finally play the game. So we've been building towards this for a good while now. It's not sort of a thing. The all oh, the World Cup challenges in two games we'll play, you know, we'll try and get ready for it. We've been we've been getting ready for this for a while. And obviously Justin's legacy is is the team, you know, that that, that has been developed and, and the culture that's been developed. You really enjoyed working with Justin Holbrook, mm. didn't you? Yeah, he was he was brilliant for me. I think I started playing my best rugby when he came in. I just thought he'd give you this air of of confidence, not only at on the pitch, but in training, you just, you know, well of a vouch, you just, everything was just brighter ideas and just, he just made the place enjoyable again to, to train for him. So, and he was such a, a funny bloke and great to be around and he just made it enjoyable and we all wanted to play for the bloke. So yeah, but it sounds like, uh, you know, we're missing him there. We all do, but you know, Christian's come in and he's been sort of the exact same. He knows nothing has to change from what Justin's done and he's just gone into this game with the same outlook, really. He's he's really excitable and enjoyable towards it. It does appear to be very intense. Yeah, if you, if you look at him weird, he, he will knock you clean, clean out. <laughs> no, that's yeah. what he's, he looks so <laughs> handy. Is yeah, he handy? Low, he's yeah. handy. Is he? Like, so I was in there a couple of days ago. Well, not a couple of days. I was in a couple of days ago. But a few weeks ago uh, in rehab. And uh, I was in really early at seven and he, he was in there. I was like, geez, you're in early. Like, he was like, oh yeah, I've just done a bit with the MMA coach. And I was like, MMA coach? Like, what have you been doing? He was like, yeah, I've just been looking at a few different techniques and stuff for this <laughs> MMA guy. And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> He's <laughs> just like getting thrown yeah. around of an MMA guy in the wrestle hall just like four in the morning. <laughs> Ridiculous. Good. I reckon you could have him in a fight, Scully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's not lying yeah. though, look no, at him. He's, he's like, get, like, get it, like, like, like sign it. Yeah, 100% man, by myself all day. Yeah, it'd be, that'd be a good, that'd be a good one. But he's, he's, he's from a, Mount I say, so what do you know that's near Penrith, I think. He's just there yeah, from I know Rushy was, Rushy was saying when he when obviously when he spoke to Christian, you know, obviously about the, the job he said, I think he said the second meeting he, he turned up with a with a shiner and a couple of stitches, he just said he'd uh, he got clopped. Uh, doing oh, doing sparring, so obviously yeah. he knows uh, he, he, he <laughs> likes that side of it. You can't have a last name Wolf and not be handy, can you? No, and he was a tongue and coach as well. You need to be handy to like look after them. He's first. got look, he's got I think four young kids and they like we took him to the local like rugby tattoo or wherever. He was like, nah, just boxing gym, hammer gym right in the corner. <laughs> My God, it was it's all like right. strict, strict regime straight in, in the wolf. Just straight, just straight in. <laughs> Let's go. So there's World Cup Challenge experience, you know, predominantly to my left. Obviously, well, you played in three, Scully played in four. What's what's standout moments, you know, from those games? Uh, I, I, well, the two Brisbane games for me, uh, particularly the one in 2001 where, where we played them, because that was a game where it was very evident nobody expected us to win. The year before, we'd had 40 put on us by Melbourne Storm. And then we were playing... Is that when Marcus By just ran you up and down the field? Marcus By and many others. Yeah, I played in a hooker for 80 minutes in that game. It was... Uh, like I said, I've, I learned some resilience that night, let me tell <laughs> yeah. you. Uh, but, uh, yeah, but in 2001, when we played Brisbane, uh, they were stacked. Uh, you know, your Gordon Tallises, your you know, Darren Lockyer's, Wendell Sailors, all, all these players who... You know, wonderful players. Nobody gave us a chance. But we had a genuine belief with, with us. I think there was only 20, 22 of us who actually believed we could win that game. A few things, you know, transpired for us on the night. Uh, you know, the, the weather turned pretty ugly for a period in the second half. The hail started coming down. We could tell they didn't really fancy it then. Uh, but, you know, we stuck at it because I think we were down 18-6 at one point in the game. But we just stuck at it, kept playing. Uh, and, uh, you know, managed to get in the game. I think Paul Newell have made a break down the left and passed the ball to Chris Joint to to get us level. And then uh, obviously Scully popped up at the end with a, with a drop goal to get us get us in front. Uh, in both him and Lunger, you know, big game players can do that for you. And we managed to hold out. And 
it, it was a really special, really special moment in, in my career, certainly because uh, I never played in the NRL throughout my career. So to get the opportunity to play against some NRL teams and have success like that was great. And we played them again in, in 2007, Scully. And that was a remarkable night for you, wasn't it? When you look back, all of the what we talked about about you know injuries and, and 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 maybe a frustrating period in your career, it still blows me away to watch that game back for your performance when you put all of that into it. As a snapshot, it's not like it's it's a great performance, but when everything you put everything into that puzzle, and is that one of your sort of fondest nights of your career? Do yeah, you I mean a lot. Obviously, it's one that gets thrown to me all the time about about that game, and you know people pick highlights and that. For me, as a highlight, as a as a player, I've I've had a lot more influence in a lot more games yeah. than than that one. Um, I think it was just getting back for that game and and doing what I did um, after the the story of the of the previous six months. Um, because obviously, you know, for anybody who don't know, I, I come back from a, an knee injury. I had a micro fracture, and originally I should only. I went to see the the surgeon, and he said you, you'll be back for for early May next year. Because it was, I'd had the micro fracture. I'd had a, an issue with me with my knee, uh, and it was it was pretty much if it can't be sorted, it could be a career ender. Yeah. Uh, and it was a guy called Andrew Williams down in in London. Uh, I got sent to the the best guy. Um, and he said, I think I can, I can sort it. He said, you'll be back for May next year. And I said, well, I can't be back for May. I said, well, I need to be back for February. So, because we've, we've got the Australian World Club Challenge, uh, champions coming over. And he didn't give me a chance. He said, but go back and, and do what, you know, we've got to do. And I was lucky, uh, Apollo obviously was the, the SNC then. Um, and he just said, you know, you, we'll make sure you play in that game, you know, Pretty much through November, December, January, I, I, I never stopped training. Uh, did everything that I could to strengthen my legs and strengthen my knee. Uh, and obviously, coming to team training, I hadn't trained with the team. Coming to team training, I think, on the Tuesday. We had a day off on the Wednesday. And Andor says, you've not got a day off. He said, we're going to get five boys. And we're going to do a 10-metre ten ten meter grid, three on three, for, for 30 minutes, and we're going to bash you. You get through it, you're on the bench on Saturday. And I must admit, I felt sorry for them five guys. Yeah, no, well, I know one of them was Gary Wheeler. So I'm playing at Toronto with Gary Wheeler now. It's so funny because I, I spoke about this podcast today and he said, just make Scully remember that day where he came in and just drilled us all the young lads down the field. Uh, <laughs> As the wheels actually said, that's the reason. Yeah, you know, it, was a, it, was a, it was a tough um, It was a tough 30 minutes, certainly for, for them boys, because there was nothing going to stop me from, from you know, playing in that game yeah. and you, know, um, you, you know well with, with that game as well that, that, like, what probably Scully wouldn't realise is that the impact of having him even on the bench yeah. and coming back for the rest of the team was, was massive yeah. to know that Paul Sculthorpe's there and he's going to come onto the field at some point given the fact you know forget the fact that he'd had a, you know, a, r a rough period of time with injuries he was going to come on and he was going to participate some in the game uh, and obviously he came on and he, he did so well, but ju just to even have him there, yeah. give everybody a huge lift going into the game. No, it's funny that, because that your presence was like a palpable, it was a thing, you know what I mean? When 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 he was around, it, it just changed our performances. And it, was, it was a strange one for me, because I've never, I think I've, I've come off the bench twice in my yeah. career. Um, so I've never... Should have done it Go more often. <laughs> <laughs> you may still be playing I'm now. <laughs> I've never. Uh, I'll give you some tips if yeah. you want. I'm used to it. <laughs> I've never done that where you, you're trying to get up to the, the speed yeah, of a game. Of you know, I, I think we're 18 minutes into the game and I come on, but just the you know the the crowd noise and everything to do that as you know we we used to running out at the start of a game and, and and starting with everybody else. So to come off the bench was was very different for me. It's something that I've never never really done. Well, so the, I think I did it the, twice the in noise my career. The when, it, when he actually got off the bench to warm up, yeah. the crowd visibly lifted a bit like a similar to when you know when Sonny Bill came off uh, on the other day when he played his first yeah. game yeah. and there was a real buzz around the ground all of a sudden. It was the same when Scully there's came off the There's only probably a handful of guys I think I've played with or been around who've got that. It's, it's, it's like an aura and it's yeah, like a presence. It's more than, it's more than just playing. There's something else. And Scully had it. Sonny got it. I think Sam Burgess had it. I think Lockers has it for Wigan as well, doesn't he? He kind of yeah. he, if he's got a long injury injury layoff, can come back from a big for a big game. I think it gives everybody else a lift and another couple of percent. Yeah, and it's it's those those little bits that you know I think make such a huge difference in in big games, don't they? So what's uh, 
What's Sonny been like? It is he good? He's been really good, Tommy. Yeah, he's been. Have top. you seen much? Of, have you seen much? Of Wilco I've not seen him. No, he's been hanging out of his yeah, ass yeah. for the last couple of months. <laughs> Two toes. That's my nickname. <laughs> have you you've got him on the back of your phone case here? Have no, you? I haven't. No, not anymore. You did have? Did no, have. no, you did not true. Big I phone. got rid of it. I was just trying to make him feel welcome. You know, he's a big sort of guy coming into the dressing room. I thought, well, make him feel welcome. I'll make a joke. So I got a phone case yeah. with his picture on it. He doesn't like. He's in good nick as well. Isn't he, he doesn't like Guinea, so he had to go down a different. Well, route. exactly. So what he did, yeah, exactly. So point out, point out the worst thing he could say about me is you're a little bit flabby and rubbish. And so what I did was got his phone case where he's he's chiselled on it. Therefore, it just neutralises the conversation straight away. <laughs> the reason I got rid of this phone case was because in day-to-day -day life, it kind of works. You know, like training, you're on the phone, lads are like, ah, ah. But it's when you go and pay for petrol <laughs> and you put your phone down on the side. Now, that's not how, you know, that even trying to explain that conversation, like, this is, you know, <laughs> it, it just didn't work. <laughs> so, big week, World Club Challenge, Flash. You're the only one, apart from me, who could make a prediction mm. about the score. But what's your, what's I, your feelings on I the game? I think Saints will go really well because a lot of the NRL teams, when they come over for the World Club Challenge, they play an arm wrestle type type game, really attritional. They'll five drives kick and they'll try and wear you down. Whereas I think Saints can, can play that game and then they've got a bit of flair. They've got some some big players that can come out up with some magic. So um, I, I think Saints will beat them. Paul, uh, preparation gone well and what's left? to go this week yeah we just uh, uh, obviously we had recovery uh, and a bit of a rest day and then uh, you know on, on Wednesday we will uh, we'll, we'll have a really solid training day and, and, and look to you know put things into practice and how how we can uh, how we can take on the Roosters and, and try and beat them on Saturday we're under no illusions of the size of the task uh, actually you know 12 months ago we were training here against the Roosters in their preparations for the game against Wigan so we pretty much saw each other at first hand in a training environment and, and we were very impressed by what what we saw then hopefully they were impressed by what they have saw you, have you watched any footage of the, the Roosters uh, so how, how, can, how can you watch it you know when obviously there's nothing to really watch this year other than what they did last year but a key figure in their their team where everything went through was, was Cooper Cronk yeah, I mean, and he's I, not there defensively I, think, I don't think much will change because I, I watch quite a bit of the NRL and their line speed's massive and their transition from attack to defence they'll kick in a corner and then they'll flood the, the, the players through and just massive line speed and then restrict you for as much as they can so I think that's one thing that they're probably the, the world leaders at the best in the NRL at um, so I think that that mindset of uh, a massive defensive display would be one that, that, that they'll bring but like you said with Cooper yeah, Cronkow things will change like you, say, you know what you're going to get with the Roosters yeah. that's that strange yeah, way isn't it I'm yeah. used to it it's that, it's that simple this week isn't it? They're, they're that good a team you don't need to Brent. bombard yourself with everything they're doing Like we, no. we know how good they are going to be it just depends on us what are we going to do to, to be better than them Why? what are we, what are we going to do to be better we're going to win aren't we so what are you going to do personally just run, run just really gonna fast. Try really, really hard. <laughs> try really, really hard to win again, again, and again, and again. Point, isn't it? To yeah. try really hard. But it yeah, isn't yeah. it? Like, well, like, just compete really, I was thinking, really hard. But I was for a on long the way, time. I was thinking of of everyone here on this panel. You thought like competitors, the best people are the best competitors. Like you want to win anything, don't you? That's why you, bec you know. That's, that's, why, why, that's why you work well in in that body. You're an absolute competitor. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, you know what I mean? That's, that seems like a really fitting no, way but to yeah. end this this podcast. Competitors, all here. <laughs> Flash Jeez, worse than anyone he gets through, but he gets a bit sulky when he loses. So it's the World Club Challenge this week. Uh, St. Helens are playing the Sydney Roosters. Thank you, Paul Wellens, Paul Schoolthorpe, Tommy Makington, Mark Flanagan. This has been Out of Your League. Please download from your podcast provider, whoever it is. Thank you. <laughs>